The book of Exodus. If, if we think about the book of Exodus, uh, sometimes in some Bibles, some of the older uh, versions refer to this as the second book of Moses. Again, giving Moses the uh, credit for the authorship. Um, I don't know if if Moses is the author of the book of Genesis, that's commonly accepted. Uh, certainly Moses wrote the book of Exodus. And so some Bibles do refer to it as the second book of Exodus. I've got us a map tonight that I think is going to help us. Now, if you remember when uh, Jacob and his family, they were, they were in the land of Canaan right here. Okay, and they traveled when they came to Egypt. This is approximately the route that they came to Egypt. And you'll notice this, this green portion in the upper left-hand corner of the map is, is the area of Goshen. Okay, now that, that area is rather uh, sparsely, or was at this time, rather sparsely populated with uh, with Egyptians. The Egyptians uh, really preferred uh, the Nile River, which which as we see comes comes down through through this area here. Um, and so the Go the area of Goshen was hilly but certainly not as desertous as some of the surrounding regions. Uh, so it made good for the uh, for the herdsmen, if you recall, when in our study of the book of Genesis, when Jacob came down, uh, that was the area that Pharaoh assigned uh, by Joseph's request uh, for, for the Israelite people. Now, a couple things I wanted to make note of that we have discussed. Uh, first of all, uh, there are some things that Joseph made statements about. And Cynthia, I'm backing up for you tonight. Because uh, I know you missed that last chapter of the book of Genesis. And I know you were really interested in that last paragraph. So uh, we're going to back up into uh, chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. I want you to make spatial note as we read this. Uh, what's going on and what statement uh, Joseph makes before he dies. So uh, Steve will begin with you tonight. If you can read for us uh, verse 22 uh, through the end of that chapter. So Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Macros the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and will bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Then Joseph sent the sons of Israel, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. All right. What does, what does Joseph say about God? That's right, Peter. God would visit. And what would God do when he visited them? Emma, I think you had something there. No, I'm pretty sure you said God would bring them up. Yeah, that's right. That's what I thought. God would bring them up. So what's he talking about, bring them up? You remember where our map was? Okay, so if, if, we, if our map, on the map, Goshen was over here. And then he went kind of around the sea. And the land of Canaan was up here. That uh, Canaan was the promised land. And so that was the idea. God was going to bring them up out of the land of Egypt into Canaan. All right. So are there, is there anything else in here? 
that, that you guys see that you want to make note of before we get on there. You know, Ruth's whole, Ruth's whole concern was that the PowerPoint would make this too organized that we couldn't chase rabbit trails. Apparently she likes rabbit trails. So I promised that I would not keep this organized and that we would still have the freedom to chase rabbit trails and to carry on discussions that are not necessarily in line with the PowerPoint. So Cynthia, I think you had made a, a point about, uh, about the generations that Joseph got to see. That it's mentioned that he, um, let's see, Benson, I can't remember still how it's put. Uh, the children of Manasseh were brought up on Joseph's knees. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. The, the King James Version says that the children of, of uh, Manasseh were brought up on Joseph's knees. Uh, is the way the King James English Standard Version reads a little bit different, but the, the condentation is that when it's talking about Manassas in the English standard, it says they were counted as his own. So it stands to my way of thinking that Joseph had a huge part in their upbringing. He, he, saw, he saw three generations of Ephraim's children. But Manassas must have had a very special place in his life in his later years. So yeah, that's, that's a good point, Cynthia. Another another aspect that we uh, we might not have cons might not have considered. Yes, Joseph lived to be 110 years old, but remember he was not a young man when he married. He was he was in the middle of his life span somewhere around. Uh, somewhere around 40, I would guess. We, we talked about that. So, so to see the length of children, the, the generations that he saw was pretty incredible for the amount of time that he had um, after he was married and had children of his own. So uh, again, this, this is, a, to me, a, an aspect that we're gonna look at a little bit later as we begin the book of Je uh, Exodus. Um, Joseph made his children, uh, or had his children make a promise. What was that promise? Bring his bones up. Now, why would we want to bring somebody's bones along? I mean, what's the point of lugging around? I, I think I said last week, what's the point of lugging around a box of bones? Peter? <laughs> Ah, oh, and that's right. You know, I meant to put a picture of a mummy on here, and I think I forgot that. Did you get the mummy on here? Oh, we forgot the mummy. Uh, so, so it was yes, it was his body the way they preserved it. But he called, he referred to that as his bones. And so, what, what, what do they do? Do they bury Joseph when he dies? No. I don't remember. Is it golden? I don't. I don't remember that necessarily. Emma, is it a golden box? It says they put him in a coffin. Which so I'll, I'll buy the box, but I'm not sure. Maybe it was gold. I don't know. But boy, that'd be an awful heavy box to lug around if it was. I seriously doubt that it was. But he may have had some some gold inlay work on it. Who knows? Um, you know the Egyptians they really like their fancy coffin. Cynthia. He had a very high position yes. For a long period of time. Yeah. The Bible doesn't tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more than more than the average Joe could afford. So, Peter. Um, they would cut the statue things that would look like this, and the royal people would have it in brass with gold. 
You know what? You're you're getting good at your your Egyptian history. Yes, that's right. The the um, funeral mask is what I'll call it. Ruth. Ah, okay. All right. So you guys have been researching that. That's great. All right. So let's uh, let's move on. I, I I think we already touched on where Joseph's body was kept in a box or in a coffin. Um, so Exodus. Do you remember what what the word Exodus means, Peter? Vernon. Very good. Very good. Emma. Peter. What what else does it mean? There's there's a little bit more. We've got it on the on the screen up here. Exodus is a military term. Okay. Now marching out. Yes. So this is not this is not a fleeing Egypt. This is not a retreat. This is this is a marching out of the people of, the, of Israel. And so we need to keep in mind the very name of the book would indicate what is going to take place in this book of history. So what I'd like for us to do is I'd like for us to, again, uh, Celia will go to you tonight. If you would, um, read verse 1 through 7, Celia, if you don't mind. 1 through 7, Celia. Of Genesis or Exodus chapter one. Read up the name of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household: Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. And Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Dan and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were 17 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. All right, so how many Israelites were there when they came to Egypt, guys? Seventy. Seventy, very good, very good. Now, um, is seventy a lot of people? Yes. Not. <laughs> so there we have it. The number seventy is subjective. You know, when you think about it, but but when you think about it in perspective, as you did, Peter, you think about the number 70 in perspective of a nation. Well, that's not even a small village. You know, even little, little old Laura Salem, we are is credited, or where we live, the, the village itself is credited of having, uh, I think, 200 people, and the number might have decreased since, but... You know, and I said one time when when Kate and I were getting to know each other, you know, I said, she asked about where I lived, and I said, well, I think they counted the cats when they came up with 200 people living in, in the village of Lower Salem. But uh, anyway, so when you think about that, that's, that's a very small number uh, of Israelites coming into Egypt, that number of 70. Now, in verse 7, though, we see here that uh, that there's that that uh, well actually below verse seven the next paragraph we're going to see that the 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 Egyptians became afraid of the Israelites. Why why would they become afraid? Because the answer is in this paragraph in verse seven. It became bigger. Okay, Peter, is that what you were going to say? Okay, give us your details. Yeah. It became big enough that the, they thought that the Israelites could take over the 
there's so there, there's going to be enough of them that there's there's a threat to the country of Egypt. Ruth. Yeah, now now something something we need to get get in our minds is we know that Joseph lived to see the third generation. Um so so the the number the, the time span. Sometimes we think we turn one page in our Bible and it's it's just like a, a, a week or two has passed or a year or two even. But this is, this is generations. Now that's not discounting what's happening here because the children of Israel are multiplying. I'm sure if they were around today, you know, I was talking to, to a preacher friend of mine today about, uh, <clears throat> about some stuff. And he said, well, he said, he said, he said something about, you know, his daughter's birthday. And, and, I, and he needed to arrange his schedule around his daughter's birthday. And I was like, oh, I remember those days when I had enough children that I could arrange my schedule around their birthdays. I'm like, now with, with having eight children and the ninth one on the way, if I scheduled everything around all the birthdays, I probably wouldn't accomplish anything. And, and Neil has never met my family. I've met Neil, but Neil has never met my family. And, Obviously, had not done enough uh, Facebook research to find out how many kids I have. And uh, he goes, you have how many kids? And I said, uh, well, Lord willing, next month we'll have nine. And uh, he, he just responded with just the, the emoticon of the open mouth. Go, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, yes. People can multiply quickly, as, as our family's living proof. But not everyone multiplies quickly. And apparently the Egyptians did not multiply as quickly as the Hebrew people. And I think, I think what the Bible would indicate here, it says, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. And I think last week we looked at that and talked about the blessing that that was and how that was a commandment that was the first commandment given to to Noah when he when he left the ark was to be fruitful and multiply Ruth you had a thought Are you trying to make us the new Egyptians? no no I'm not making us Egyptians or Hebrews in this case uh, no that's that's not the goal and mission in my life but in verse 8, I want to pick up here and read verse 8 through 14. Um, Peter, why don't you begin us off with verse 8, and then uh, then we'll see how that goes, and maybe someone else will pick up from that point. He did not know Joseph and he said, said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too many for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Lest, lest they multiply if or Breaks. Breaks out. 
escape. Okay, hey, hold on. Let's let Ruth take over there in verse 11. Uh, she's got to find her place now. Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. Hey, why don't you finish that paragraph out if you're able? Yes, 12 through 14. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel worthless slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and more to work. And all kinds of work in the field, in all their work, they ruthlessly made them worthless slaves. All right, so in, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, Adolf Hitler coined uh, term, the Jewish problem. That's exactly what Pharaoh is doing right here. The only thing is, Pharaoh, unlike Adolf Hitler, does not want to annihilate the Israelite people from the face of the earth, but he has two fears. The first fear uh, that we see is um, is the fear that they would uh, join the enemies. He says, behold, in verse 9, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. His first fear in verse 10 says, lest they multiply and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us. That's the first concern is that they would join the enemies of the Egyptians and fight against them. The second, that they would escape from the land. <laughs> so, so here we have a twofold problem. Now, first of all, can anyone imagine why Pharaoh would be concerned about the Israelite people joining the enemies? Any ideas? I think if we would go back in our book, in our in the book of Genesis, I think we would find the answer to that. Yeah. Do you remember when when the Israelites came down into the land of Egypt? Um, do you remember that a shepherd, what a shepherd was to the Egyptian people? That's right, Katie. The shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptian people. And we also saw when Joseph's brothers first came down, to Egypt and they were visiting with him. Do you remember the table arrangements? There, there was a table in Joseph's house. There was a table for Joseph as governor of Egypt and his family. And then there was a table for the Egyptians, the servants. And then there was a table for the Hebrews. And it was noted there for Hebrews were an abomination to the Egyptian people. So can you imagine 
living in a segregated world, a segregated country. Could you imagine if war broke out with Egypt, with a nation that might not have felt that the Hebrews were an abomination? Can you imagine that the Hebrews would certainly want to join that country in fighting against the Egyptians? Because after all, they have been the brunt of the Egyptians for generations now. And so even, even as far as, as uh, a lot of the, most of the marriages, you know, Egyptians didn't marry Hebrews, Hebrews didn't marry Egyptians for the most part throughout this time period. But remember Joseph? Do you guys remember Joseph? He married an Egyptian. Well, yeah, he married an Egyptian, but what did he do for the land of Egypt? Yeah, that's right, Peter. He's, he essentially, Joseph saved the land of Egypt during the famine period. But how long has he been gone? How long has Joseph been dead? Well, we really don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we can, we can rest assured it has been quite a period of time. And again, don't know that 100% for sure uh, how long he's been dead. But it's been long enough that he has been forgotten. Because, just a minute, Peter, I'll get to you in just a second. Because uh, it says here, now there arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So this fellow had no memory of the great things. That just goes to show the greatest person on earth is going to someday die, and sooner or later the earth is going to forget that he ever existed. So, Peter, what's your thought there? Um... It should have been put so long that um, the Egyptians would tell stories of when our grandfathers, like great grandfathers, and if it was assumed that they should, they would thought of Joseph as this sweet guy that Pharaoh doesn't really like. Are you saying that my stories about your ancestors are important? That would be the only way that they could be short. Sure. Yeah. That's the only way you're going to know about someone that's long dead, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So Pharaoh was afraid of them because he was afraid they were going to overtake them. And he had forgotten Joseph. But then he says in verse 10, let us deal shrewdly with that. And Cynthia, I've forgotten. What does your King James Version say there? Wisely. Wisely. So again, this is not this is not earthly wisdom. And I think that's why the English Standard Version uh, chose the word shrewdly uh, for that word. Both words fit very well, but we don't want to get confused with godly wisdom uh, in that word wisely. And so he says, we're going we're gonna to come up with a plan. And we're going to fix this problem. So what was Pharaoh's plan to deal with that problem? Do you remember? Make it more that's right. That's found in verse 11. He says, test taskmasters over there. And uh, he says uh, that the purpose of that was to afflict them with heavy burdens. So in other words, we're going to work them to the point to where they're not going to feel like having more children. Because children are a lot of work, right? We understand that. We've, you know, those of us who have children, even those who don't have children. Ruth, you know, she understands children are a lot of work because she has to help with a lot of little brothers and sisters. So I want to think about these cities for just a moment. These uh, storehouse cities. We're gonna we're gonna uh, think about those. And uh, Pithram and Ramos are re are referred to as store cities. The Hebrew word means a magazine store or storehouse or a stored up treasure. 
is essentially what that word means. And so it was, it was literally that. It was a place to store stuff. Now, what strikes me as interesting, we talked about this before, Peter, what, what, who came up with the idea of storing up valuables in Egypt? Joseph um, came up with the idea because of famine, and he needed somewhere to store um, the food and material. Okay, that's right. Now, I looked for a map to try to locate where these cities were. I found a lot of possible pictures but I could not actually locate them on a map. I'm sure there's a map or something out there that would locate these, but is it? Kate says it's on the main map, but um, so we'll, we'll, we'll hit that again when we get to that map. But anyway, we, we were trying to find as likely a pictures as, as anything for that, but we found the one and put it on there. Um, now, did Pharaoh's solution for the, what I'll refer to as the Jewish problem in Egypt, did it work? No. Okay. They, what happened? They went the opposite direction, they went the opposite direction didn't it, Ruth? I think you lost me there. Everything multiplies. Is that what you're getting at? All right. First 15 through 22. Uh, Steve, or, well, Cynthia, do you feel like reading tonight? Are you, you want to read verse 15 through 22 for us? Okay, if you, if you get uh, stuck or something and can't, can't see the finish, Steve will pick that up. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Now, we have talked before when we studied this section about a birth story. Right here is a picture of a birth story. Now, there are variations of this, but this is, this is a birthing school used even today by midwives, and probably something very similar to this is used in Egypt. Uh, there, like I say, there's some variations, but uh, this is this is a pretty standard, simple birthing stool. Peter, you had a thought. Um, when they're sending the cast off, like they was asking me where there's two boys that were born and they're 
tossed them into a river and we catch them at it. They're kind of lost. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a story. Yes, I remember the story, but um, yeah, that's that's true. Let's uh, think about this. Uh, what what Pharaoh is doing, though? Yeah, who did Pharaoh give instructions to kill all the baby boys? Who did he give those instructions to? Who's that, Vernon? The midwives. We find that in verse 15. Now, I have a question for you. We have some states in this country that have now legalized, uh, basically, they've essentially have legalized killing a child after it's born. Now, these midwives had a response to Pharaoh's order. And... Sapphira, uh, Shifra, and Pua, uh, their, their names remain in the Bible. Moses recorded their names. And that, that fact that he recorded these two women's names just stands to reason how much. These two women were honored and revered by the children of Israel generations after they are gone. Now, I mean, this, this is generations that these, these women have been gone. But Moses recorded their names for us to remind us of who they were and to tell us what, what and how they were remembered. Now, let me, let me ask you this. In thinking about things, why did the midwives disobey Pharaoh's order? There's a very specific reason given us. Because why, Emma? Peter, what's your answer? Because the midwives feared God. That's absolutely correct. They feared God. What does it mean to fear God? This might be an adult question. What does it mean to fear God? Okay. There's a song. I don't. I don't think we sing it here very often, or maybe maybe we never have. But I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and built the lofty skies. God is God is powerful. Now this is interesting, and I want I want you to notice something in here. We're going to get to something uh, next week, but something that I find interesting. And that actually, let's just go ahead. I want to turn to Joshua for a minute. When Joshua makes that great statement, Joshua chapter 24, and we'll revisit this passage next week, but in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua makes a, a great statement, and he's telling the Israelite people, he says, Now therefore, in Joshua 24, 14, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods, small g, that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and served the Lord. And even if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, small g, or your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods, small g, of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, when Joshua makes that statement, there is something that we need to pick up on. That, that Moses is not recording for us right now at this time in the book of Exodus. We need to pick up on that the children of Israel were caught up in idolatry. Okay? However, these two Hebrew midwives 
And whether it was just two Hebrew midwives or whether these two were overseers of other midwives, we do not know. But these two Hebrew midwives feared God. And so I want to stress to you that these two midwives were not caught up in idolatry. But Joshua's statement would indicate that some of the children of Israel were caught up in idolatry. And over in Exodus chapter 2, we'll get to Lord willing next week, we'll see how some of the other children of Israel were caught up in idolatry at least to a point, and had forgotten the God of their fathers. So these two midwives disobeyed God because they feared God and respected God. What can we learn from this? What lesson can we take away from this? That's right. Don't forget God. God's important not to forget. But let me ask you this, Peter. Can we remember God and not fear God? Ruth, is it possible to remember God and not serve God? Vernon, is it possible to remember God, not fear God enough that we're willing to disobey Him? It is possible. It is possible. Let's look at Acts chapter uh, 5. In Acts chapter 5, we have an incident with the disciples. And they're in a position where they have to choose who they respect more. Do they respect the Jewish Sanhedrin? Or do they respect God? Friends, I want you to entertain the thought with me tonight that there are times in our lives where we have to choose who we're going to respect and who we're going to fear. Listen to the response that Peter gives. But Peter and the other apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And that is the attitude which led these midwives to be pleasing in the sight of God. Now when the midwives uh, went back, when Pharaoh called these midwives back in, and they told him this, uh, he said, why haven't you done that? Let me get back here in my Bible. Uh, he he, he pulls, the, pulls the midwives back in. And uh, in verse 18, so the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. What's the response? That's right. That's right. They had the babies before we could get there. Now, there's a couple things in this. I want you to think about this. Is this a lie or is this the truth? Did the midwives lie to Pharaoh? We don't know. It is quite possible that they did not. Or it's possible that they did. The Bible does not tell us that. But what I want you to notice is their response. And, and this cracks me up every time I read the response. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Now, this, 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 this is kind of almost a slap in the face to the Egyptian women to a point. You know, they're not these weak, spindly things. These women are tough. Okay, let's, let's think about that. These women are tough. Cynthia, you had a thought. <laughs> who go into labor and deliver on the way to the hospital. Or in the middle of a snowstorm and testing and, and nobody, you know, the, the uh, emergency squad or whoever can't get there fast enough. And I know with, with me, um, 
my doctor told Greg, the next one you have, if she says how, there are some women, and I have no doubt in my mind that God blessed these people with, you know, with this. Mm-hmm. That, and if there's only two of them serving, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we don't know what you said, if they were the, the chiefs, or if there were more of them, but on foot or on camel or something, whatever, mode of transportation. Yeah. Now, here's, here's my perspective, Ruth. I'll get to you in just a second. Here's my perspective on this. The midwives fear God enough to disobey Pharaoh's order. What makes us think they're going to stand there and tell a bold-faced lie to Pharaoh and risk hellfire and damnation for telling a lie? You know, I realize the law of Moses has not yet been handed down. But the lie is has been wrong since the creation of the world. Cain lied to God. Adam and Eve lied to God. All of those things are sin and have been sin from the beginning. Ruth first and then I'll get to you, Peter. Ruth? Wouldn't there be more midwives if they were the nation was really that big? Let me ask you this. You start with 70 people. How many... Children, do you think, can be born in a year's time? <laughs> okay, now, now, now let's think about this. Maybe, like I said at the beginning, maybe these are two head midwives that coordinate things. It's possible. I don't know. I kind of doubt it. I'm thinking these two are the two men, two midwives that service, you know, all of the Hebrew people. I don't know for sure. Um, but maybe, maybe they're like the Freedom Millers of Ohio that just coordinate all these other midwives, work with them and around them. I don't know. Peter? Those two women. The Bible says they speed up pace with birth. That's right. That's right. And that's what. That's what the midwives told Pharaoh. More than a couple babies had people needed the midwives. Well, to Bruce's point, obviously there weren't enough midwives to go around that couldn't make it to the births. So, I don't know. But I, I don't, after giving this some thought and consideration, I don't think that the midwives told Pharaoh a lie. I really don't. Um, with that having been said, what's Pharaoh's solution to this now? He, gave, he gives a solution that that goes beyond the midwives. Peter? Um, with having children with me, Babies on my mind would slow, if I were them, I'd, it would slow me down on packing up. Okay. Now, now, Pharaoh says, Pharaoh now gives a commandment to all his people. So everyone in Egypt, all the Egyptians, you see a boy, throw him in the river. Kill him. Be done with him. We'll see you next time that turns out in Exodus chapter 2.